thank you everyone who showed up. Very thrilled to be here with you today. Folks, my name is Brandon Harami. I have the pleasure of being the Bay Area Vice Chair of the California Democratic Party Progressive Caucus. And my pronouns are he, him, a hit. Um, please, if you haven't already, I would love for you to sign into today's meeting and please refer to the CalDem Code of Conduct. I just dropped two links into the chat. Um, we are going to be having a really wonderful and awesome event. Uh, we'll be featuring uh, um, some one of my favorite assembly members, Laura Friedman, uh, who has been an amazing and collaborative champion uh, for transit justice in the California State Assembly. Um, we'll also be, dis uh, and with Laura Friedman and Assembly Member Friedman, we're gonna be talking a lot about transit equity and justice, um, particularly uh, her bill that would better uh, fund transit in an equitable way. As someone who works for the city of Oakland, uh, transit equity is in the forefront of my mind because it, uh, it acts uh, pollution and air quality in black and brown communities in Oakland. And uh, the impact would be very positive for uh, the rest of the state and help us hit our climate goals. Um, we're also going to be talking about single player payer healthcare with two of our, our favorite uh, and powerful orgs, the California Nurses uh, Association, which is based right here in Oakland. Very excited to be having one of my favorite Oakland unions uh, and California unions on board. Um, and we're going to be talking uh, with the coalition uh, Healthy California Now, which has been an amazing advocate for single payer healthcare. Now we're going to have a really fun and collaborative and respectful conversation. So uh, even if one of the speakers is the worst person in the world and uh, called your mom ugly, uh, we're going to be very polite and hear them out. We're going to be focusing on people's ideas uh, and not attacking individuals, uh, participating organizations or speakers. Uh, we're not going to talk about, uh, uh, really want to have a negative conversation about approaches or ideas, but really focus on the core issues. And, and the thing that we all agree are around today, we need cleaner, greener transit. California will not hit its transit goals uh, and its climate change goals unless we build more green transit and ensure uh, we are uh, you know, finishing major uh, transit projects. Uh, living in the Bay Area, I want to see more buses. I want to see more trains. Um, and uh, we're all aligned around the fact that we need a federal and state single-payer health care. Uh, all the speakers that will be speaking tonight have been strong advocates for single-payer health care. So we are, we are very, very excited to be having them. Um, so uh, I, I uh, know as someone who works collaboratively with a, with a large policy group, which is the Oakland City Council, that we have to work collaboratively. This is going to be an exciting opportunity for us who are both transit nerds and healthcare nerds to have a collaborative discussion on how we move our state forward. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead. I'll drop. make sure that the links in the chat will be dropped again. I hope you have an amazing and fun time. I will be in the chat and making sure that you're all respectful, kind, and your wonderful selves. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and hand this back to Jenny. All right, Jenny. I'm on mute, unmute myself. Hi, thank you so much, Brandon. Brandon is a stalwart progressive and very savvy politically. Lucky to have you on our team. Um, I'm Jenny Chang, I'm a community organizer and now staffer in the assembly where I work for the uh, chair of assembly transportation. I'm very privileged to do so. Um, she is assembly member Laura Friedman and as a legislator, if you've observed her work and her votes, she really excels at pushing progressive policy. Um, and it's been pretty uh, impressive to witness, especially as it's a field that's dominated by men. Um, you know, the opposition to bills such as the one we're gonna learn about tonight is often men in suits, um, you know, representing the status quo, the establishment. Um, but I'm really grateful to see you all here tonight. Um, it's a reminder to me, especially that we're social creatures and village mentality is really healthy and capitalism constantly tries to split the village apart only for us to make it make us hire it back. <laughs> um, I especially experienced that as a mom. Um, but it's really good to see you all. Um, and if you know you're like me as a single payer activist who's attracted to the bill because you know attracted to single payer because it's a transformative and systems changing um, type of just aspirational vision, I think you'll also be attracted to AB 2438 because it is also challenging the status quo um, and challenging same, you know, the same old thinking that produces the same old uh, horrible results. So someone else, we have a surprise guest tonight, um, Assembly Member Alex Lee, so graciously wanted to chime in tonight and I wanna let him have some words as he's here and we're lucky to have him. Could someone help spotlight? Harry. 
Hey everyone, good evening. Uh, Alex Lee here, State Assembly member from the Bay Area. I just wanted to pop in really quick. Uh, I'm going to be listening today, but you're going to hear from our tremendous, tremendous progressive champion and transportation chair, Laura Friedman, about how we're going to help achieve green infrastructure. And of course, as Brenda noted, we're not going to be able to hit our climate change policies without finding actually more transit options and getting people out of combustion engine vehicles. So, so important. Uh, certainly you'll hear from a really great bill that's in session right now. And we are working right now in the legislature to hopefully bring back our wealth tax too, which is a tax on extreme billionaires and mega millionaires to help fund these things. We need to have it a stable revenue. And honestly, of course, as you always see every day in the news, there are mega millionaires and billionaires who do not pay what they owe. And so we're going to be working on that to have more stream reliable uh, stream of revenue for our transportation system, because without that, we won't be able to have a fair, uh, a fair, reliable and free transit system, which we need to get to, right? We there are so many great cities in the entire world that have great transit systems. We can learn from them. And I'm really proud to be serving on the transportation committee with the chair, Laura Friedman. So you're going to hear a lot about that amazing bill. But I just want to say thank you for all the incredible fight you do, fight you're in. And uh, you're going to hear from Laura like right after me. So Thank you so much, Assembly Member. Um, next up, we'll have Julia Kingsley, who will speak on the bill. She is the policy steward for AB 2438. Hey, everybody. It's great to meet you. I'm so, so grateful to be here and see so many amazing people coming out. This is one of my favorite things to do and really grateful to Jenny and Brandon. Um, so I'm Julia Kingsley. I work my day job, I'm a policy analyst for the Assembly Transportation Committee. So what that means is I have kind of a wonky job and I'm kind of a transportation nerd. My job is to translate the transportation bill so that we can all understand them, including myself, because this is a very, very complicated issue area, as you will learn. Um, and really grateful to work for um, Assembly Member Laura Friedman as chair. My, the way I approach transportation is with an environmental justice background, it's what I studied in environmental policy, um, and really trying to figure out how transportation planning and funding, I, I think about it as, it's how our communities are organized. So how we plan and how we fund totally dictates what projects go where, how housing is, you know, where health priorities are, and how we really make communities. So that's where AB 243 is based on state research that says that we need to organize our transportation system way better than we do. Um, and so I have slides. Should I share those? Yes, oh. go ahead, please. Okay, I don't have access to them right now. <laughs> oh, let me let me do that for you. Okay, is that okay? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think on the second one is great, Jenny. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's you know a direct quote from our our governor. Um, California communities experience the devastating impacts of climate change every day, which we are feeling, seeing, breathing, um, and that the state's draft carbon neutrality roadmap doesn't go far enough or fast enough. And the thing that really, you know, to highlight here is we know what we need to do, but we're not doing it. You know, we pledged as a state to, re to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% and by 80% by 2050. We've also committed to achieve carbon neutrality. Um, but with transportation as California's biggest emitter, substantial changes in vehicles, fuels, operations, and user choices must be achieved to meet the state's emission um, and reduction goals. Um, there have been reports and executive orders over the past two years that all, that all agree that we need to change the way we do things if we really want to meet our climate goals. One most recent report that was actually um, a piece of legislation authored by Assemblymember Friedman on transportation as it relates to the state's climate goals found that there's a huge gap between the vision for a more climate friendly and equitable transportation system that the state we've all agreed to and the actions and infrastructure spending decisions. So how, where we're really putting where our money where our mouth is. Um, also projects, transportation projects currently in the pipeline. So ones that are ready to be planned and implemented and break ground are rarely reevaluated to assess how they're alignment with the current state priorities. So we're kind of funding things without looking back and saying, oh, do we actually still want to? 20 years from now, do we want the same project? There's also there's also a finding that was the um, institutional structure for transportation is incredibly complicated and the decision-making levers are unclear. So to the public, to legislatures, to the administration, it's 
it's, I should have brought this funding chart called Terp C. That's just, it's so complicated and it's complicated for a reason. Um, yeah, we are not over 30, we're not putting our money where our mouth is. Over $30 billion, and that's federal, state, and local, is spent annually in California maintaining and expanding transportation infrastructure. $30 billion. We're about to get that much from the federal government. Um, well, nearly 50% of California's greenhouse gas emissions, 40 to 50%, is generated by the transportation um, sector. About half of those expenditures are at the local level. So we're talking, you know, from state funding, really a lot of it too is local funding, which is about 6.6 .6 billion annually, more than any other single state or federal transportation program. Um, and the transportation sources for greenhouse gas emissions are roughly 80% of our fog, of our smog forming emissions and 90% of diesel particulate emissions in California. Um, okay, yeah. So even we need a system change. It's not just climate change. It, we really need a system change. I, you know, our transportation system reflects the economic, political, technological, and cultural conditions of their time. When the projects are planned, it reflects how, what our priorities are, as well as the specific context in how they operate. The more roads we build and the wider the roads are, the more we're going to drive. In the more, and it's going to stay that way. Um, transportation technology is certainly helpful. You know, our ZEV technology, that's really important and different kinds of fuels, that's great. It's still kind of uncertain. We don't have the total, we haven't done the math on what the whole life cycle impacts of that are. And the thing is, we're still using land inefficiently. Um, what we do know is that putting greater funding and attention on different projects than roads will make an impact. Um, we will keep driving if our system doesn't change. According to the federal government, although during COVID, vehicle miles traveled, so the amount of miles that every vehicle was driving did decrease, um, it went right back up in 2021. Um, in fact, rose 11% from 2020 to 2021. Um, in order to meet our, our state greenhouse gas reduction goals, we have to reduce our vehicle miles traveled um, by 18% by 2035. So we want to go this way, but we're, <laughs> we're going this way. So dependence on driving is key, is key to really get at these goals, is, is key to, to changing how we move about the land that we do have. Um, and it's it will get at our state's equity, health, and safety goals, not just climate. They're all so interrelated. Um, the, admit, the, get, the Newsom administration's Climate Action Plan on Transportation Infrastructure, that's a lot of words, CAPDI for short, is a framework to change the way the state prioritizes transportation projects. So this for example, one example is when there's an opportunity to address congestion, CAPTI, kind of this framework, would require the state to consider alternatives to widening the freeway, which could lead to more walking paths, better transit, and bike options. As we know, we need to modernize transportation planning programming in order to achieve the state's goals. Walking, biking, transit, other modes of active transportation, improve health, reduce our dependence on driving, and overall VMT. We have to give priority to these different mobility options. We can't just keep going to roads as the way, oh, we're gonna maintain them. Oh, we're gonna build more, because that's what we do. Um, and the, this cap tie framework does provide a durable framework where we can evaluate the actions for effectiveness. So look at the projects over time and how can we can adapt and you know really make a community that we all wanna live in. Um, okay, yeah, great. Next one for the funding program. So this, so this bill really attaches to, and this is again where my wonky is, is coming in. So this two two four three deals with five of the state's largest transportation funding programs. So it requires these programs to incorporate the principles of CAPTI of this climate framework for transportation into. The, how project, how transportation projects are selected. Now, 
just to give you a perspective in terms of how much money that really is, the shop program, um, the 2022 shop was about $17.9 billion over four years. In a recent report, only 50% of projects funded within that program have alignment with any of the state's climate goals. The, um, the ITIP, the next one, Transportation Improvement Program, is about 52, or it's $2.1 billion over four years. And approximately 350 million of that is recommended for widening. So this is to say these programs need attention. They need, we need to require the state to reevaluate and say, okay, yes, we may have promised this project 20 years ago, but is that really what, what we want to keep doing? Is that how we want to spend our state dollars to continue to widen, continue to pave? Those can be a really important priority. Not every widening project is the same. Not every rehabilitation project is the same. But we really need to look at, take a holistic look at what are we building towards? How are we building it? So that's what this bill tries to works works towards. Um, yeah, and that's yeah. So on right, in the next one for what it does, that I kind of went over that a little bit. But really, so yeah, it codifies sustainability and equity guidelines through CAPTI. So it requires those five largest state funding programs to incorporate the um, strategies of CAPTI. It also requires uh, three of the, of the state's transportation agencies, so the ones who control the funding, plan the projects, all that, to establish transparency and accountability for transportation funding. So they would be required to show online, hold a public hearing for how they're incorporating these, these strategies into the guidelines and project nominations. So how they'd be accountable to the public as to how they're doing that. It also requires a realistic projection as to how we can actually fund more equitable and sustainable transportation projects long-term, 2050. Right now, our long-term planning document doesn't have a financial element in it. So that'll, that it will increase transparency in state, in state spending around transportation dollars and how we're gonna keep getting there to achieve our 2050 goals. So hopefully all that all that jargon and information really got you fired up because this is something that is needed more than ever. Um, you know, we talked about a little bit, okay, yes, the kind of men in suits who are working on this. It, that's absolutely true. Transportation feels like a very untapped space in terms of change that's needed. So we really, really, really need your help. Um, it's going to be heard in Senate appropriations on August 8th. Um, and so anytime you know, reach out to our office, reach out to me around just kind of questions, how you can help all of that. This is, this is the time because our planet isn't getting any cooler. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. That's not easy to do that in such a short period of time. Um, that was great. Um, next up we have Naila. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Naila Popardin. I am the Executive Director of Climate Plan. We're a statewide coalition of organizations that care about reducing our GHG emissions and aligning our spending with our funding, I mean, our funding with our climate goals. I'm also a, a delegate for AD7. Um, so, hello, hello. Um, so I'm here to talk about how to decolonizing transportation funding. And Julia did a really good job explaining how complicated it is. And so for folks that love jargon, I'm gonna lean in a little bit more. Um, and I think we can talk about transportation and think that it's really complicated, but all of us use some type of transportation infrastructure. All of us are walking, biking, using roads. And so we all are deeply invested and honestly know more than we think. Um, so, we're talking about billions of dollars that are right now misaligned. When our transportation system was created and, and the way that we've been adding to it is when a hot button issue comes up, we create a new program. Um, so when walking and biking, we realize there's an importance for that, we create the active transportation programs. When our freeways are super congested, we create the solutions for congested corridors program. We have this additive process. Very rarely are we ever going back and analyzing the programs that are already in place. Very rarely are we actually going back and saying, 
you know, 30 years from now, we created a transportation program that's all about fixing highways. Is there a way to turn this program into something that's going to be more climate friendly, more equitable, and um, safe? One of the things that I love about uh, AB 2438 is the co-benefits involved. So it's not just about safety, it's not just about climate, it's not just about equity, but it's really about making sure that we're spending our money at the intersections of all of those issues. Um, so while I said it can be really complicated, here's the other thing. Take a moment for me and imagine your commute. I know COVID messed that up, but imagine your old commute. You would get on a road, potentially, you would get on your street, it would go to a larger road. Some of us would get on highways, get off those highways, go into these big center sectors. Some of us would bike. None of us are, sorry, my three-year-old is uh, joining in. None of us were ever thinking about what transportation program we got that money from. No one was thinking, oh, right now I'm on a road managed by the county. Oh, and now I'm moving to an artillery managed by the state. And so we need some type of process that can help streamline all of these different funding programs and make sure that no matter who's spending money, the climate, I mean, we're advancing climate equity and health. Transportation spending is completely colonized by folks at the top mm -hmm. who understand this system. And 2438 really helps us simplify and get a better understanding for everyone on how to engage in our transportation system, make sure that it has co-benefits and is aligned with our climate. Thank you. Thank you, Naila. So appreciate you. Um, next up, we have Dr. Bill Honingman. Hi, Judy. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. How's my audio? Great. <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, uh, hello, everyone, and thanks to the coalition for sponsoring this town hall. Um, you probably know me as a retired emergency room physician. Uh, organizer with Progressive Democrats of America and a long time advocate for single payer universal health care. But today I'm here to advocate for the intersection of health and clean, green, and universally accessible transportation, particularly in my role as Southern California Vice Chair of the Senior Caucus of the CDP. Uh, for the health and well being of California seniors, we need systems that provide for those with limited mobility, and especially for those in the traditionally underserved communities of our state. And they're subject to economic deprivation based on race, gender, or regional considerations, generally unfavorable to commercial rather than public interests. So people don't think about public transportation being a part of our system of care, but it is. Seniors and the disabled often have needs for mobility displaced onto family members and others to assist them. That can be unnecessary with more access to buses and light rail. Keeping medical appointments, getting a prescription filled, or quality time spent with children and grandchildren, a ball game, a zoo, a beach, a park, or a theater, or a museum could be easily achieved with better public transportation. Sustainable transportation is about health, independence, and equity. It's about safe and responsible mobility, universally available and easy to use. It's about empowerment for all young and old for the purpose of mental and physical health. And that's why going green is necessary for health and health is necessary for going green. Uh, lastly, please do as I have and send your comments to advocate for this to the California Senate Appropriations Committee. And remember, we are the change that we seek. Thanks and onward. Thank you, Dr. Bill. <laughs> Single payer champion, long time. I think he's watched Fix It 200 times, literally. Um, next, we have Sandy. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I am Sandy Naranjo, and I'm a proud progressive elected ADEM for the 80th district down here in South San Diego. And I'm also a proud appointed for a progressive pork commissioner for the Port of San Diego, ready to push for progressive policies that empower workers, women, BIPOC, LGBT, 
QIA folks and our planet. And I'm here this evening to present as a policy advocate for Climate Plan, as Climate Plan is the proud co-sponsor of AB 2438. And I have been honored to collaborate with the leaders on this panel to create the groundswell of support for AB 2438. As stated, it is clear that California is not on track and the recent AB 285 report done by independent transportation experts told us how we can start getting it. AB 2438 takes in on those recommendations and is really a no brainer on how we can start to seriously address on tackling emissions from the transportation sector, which is the largest for greenhouse gas and pollution. But we know it's not as simple as experts are ignored and the threat to change the status quo emboldened stouts into the experts recommendations incorporated in AB 2438. This has led to false statements being circulated such as that this bill will stop projects, it will kill jobs, it will eliminate roads, and it will kill our goods movement, which is exactly what this bill will not do. So it is inevitable that there needs to be grassroots action and advocacy to get this done. We know we don't have much time left, and with California slated to receive billions of dollars for transportation from the Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act, we need to make sure that this will be spent on addressing those transportation inequities, create good paying jobs and improve the environmental health of California. So I'm going to share my screen because I want you to see of all the organizations that supported this bill so far. So as you can see on my screen, we have secured over 50 plus organizations. Also, 11 elected, elected officials from Congresswoman Annette Barigan down to San Diego City Council President Sean Elo Rivera have all thrown in their support for AB 2438. There is a wide range of support for this bill because we know what those aspirational plans are. We've talked about it for over a decade, what we want to see in California. But in order to get the type of infrastructure done, we must prioritize on how we're going to spend that money. This is why we have environmental justice advocates, public health professionals, and even a labor union, which is Unite Here Local 30 that represents hotel workers here in San Diego, who are all supporting this bill because we need climate friendly and equitable transportation. And so we hope that you can all join this movement. And later on this program, Jenny and I are gonna tell you exactly how you can get plugged in to push our Senate Probes Committee to make sure that this gets into law. Back to you, Jenny. Actually, I'm gonna introduce Amr Circle here. Thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you for your amazing work. You are a brilliant organizer. Um, Amar, if you don't mind. My my uh, my sibling Igor is coming up next. Uh, my sibling Igor Igor is coming up next for the uh, uh, environmental caucus. And I just want to say thank you for all of this amazing policy work. Right, we need to know the details of the bill. But I also want to impress on folks that this is it, folks. So when you when we're live, things get interesting. Uh, and what I was saying is, um, you know, this is the whole ball of wax, right? When we talk about the Green New Deal nationally, we put in all this work. These are the pieces locally that we are building energy for and that Igor from the Environmental Caucus has been building energy for. So please, you know, I know if we were in person, we'd be cheering, but uh, we need to build energy to get this policy work done. So Igor, uh, take it away. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Good. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm probably going to be spe speaking of all the amazing uh, women uh, and other gender organizers here. Probably going to be one of the few white guys you're going to hear from. But um, I'm Igor. I use he, him pronouns. I'm chair of the Environmental Caucus. And it is my sincere honor and pleasure to introduce an incredible champion for transportation justice, for environmental equity, and so many other important issues, obviously, uh, single payer as well. Assembly member Laura Friedman has long been recognized as a steadfast advocate 
for the environment, sustainable communities, and active transportation. In 2020, she was appointed to serve as a chair of the Assembly Committee on Transportation. And this marked a shift towards forward thinking policies for California, such as investing in mass transit, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, zero emission vehicles, road safety, sustainability, and so many other things. She's championed data-driven transportation policy that focuses on the link between housing and transportation and on improving road safety for all users, including landmark, sorry, landmark legislation to provide local communities with greater flexibility to set speed limits on their roadways. She was also a vocal supporter of single payer bill SB 562 and a co-author of AB 1400. So without further ado, please give a shout as we introduce assembly member and transportation chair Friedman to be our next speaker. Hi everybody. Uh, I, I can't tell you how overwhelming it is to, to be here and to hear uh, not just the kinds of words about me, but to see so much interest in this legislation and in this policy. And I want to thank all of you, Amar, and, and um, everybody for having me here. I uh, want to give a shout out to Alex Lee, who's such an incredible addition to the legislature and such a progressive champion. And, you know, to Jenny Chang for, you know, helping to facilitate this, who's a great um, addition to and partner in my office. Of course, you heard from Julia, and that's, you know, the person along with Isaiah King in my office who have been dealing with the very wonky details of this very wonky bill um, and who really have made this possible. Um, Dr. Bill for being here to talk about the importance of um, our transportation policy for public health. Uh, you know, I, I was chairing, I, so a lot of the work I do in the legislature is around the environment and climate. That's a huge part of my reason for being in Sacramento. And, and Nelia for, you know, for her son showing up on the Zoom is really perfect because we are doing this for our children. I have a nine-year-old and I worry every single day about the world that she's inheriting politically, of course, but also in terms of having a livable planet and a habitable planet. This is something I care deeply about and, and really drives me. So I was chairing natural resources and California really is a role model in, the, in this country for sustainability in so many areas with energy generation, with what we're doing now with plastic pollution, with a lot of areas. But the one area that has been such a stubborn outlier is transportation which is now responsible for the bulk of our climate emissions. And when you look at the impact on the way that we've done transportation in California, as has been said, you have to look at it holistically. It's not just about the tailpipe emissions, although that is huge and meaningful, but it's also about the way that we use land, You know, the amount of paving that we put down over the earth, the amount of resources we devote to parking and parking lots, which is something that I'm working on in other legislation in um, the way that we center single passenger vehicles without recognizing that there are many users of the road who do not drive. Uh, you know, and Bill mentioned this, but all of us as we age, there'll be a time when we're not able to drive because just cognitive, cognitively, we don't function as well as we did at one point in terms of the input that's coming in you know, to our brains and our ability to see sometimes physically. And I've gotten to the point where I have trouble because of my cataracts, actually dealing with glare from headlights, you know? So, you know, sooner rather than later, this is something we all have to deal with. Certainly young people, you know, children are not driving. Uh, there are people in the, um, you know, in the community who, uh, because of physical conditions, uh, can't operate a car. And then, you know, we also can't forget that there are many people to whom owning and operating a single passenger vehicle is prohibitively expensive. So we have people who take public transportation because the burden of paying for a car, insuring a car, paying for gasoline is overwhelming for people who are also having to deal with a high cost of living from rent and other places. Um, and, we're for, and the congestion that we have as we sprawl across our area uh, has pr pronounced um, uh, impact on people's quality of life. And then housing, which is something that's very important to me as well, becomes a huge um, battleground because of our over-reliance on cars. Now, how do we know this? I know this as an elected official who was a local elected official, that every time we wanted to build every housing in our community, what does it people always say? I don't want to add more housing because of parking and congestion. 
So we have actually made it difficult for people to even have a roof over their heads near where they work because we have over said that they are only going to get around our community in single passenger vehicles. So what this bill is about is, is, is understanding the nexus between all of those issues and really forming system change. As, we, as I love the title of this town hall about system change, because if we're really going to be sustained, oh, and one other thing I forgot, public health, of course, about um, tailpipe emissions, but also about getting um, you know, exercise from walking and cycling. But one other piece that's really important and that's community building. We do not relate to people very well when we're only driving past them or seeing them through a windshield. And there's something about understanding our neighbors when you are on public transportation or on a sidewalk and you are physically interacting with your neighbors that can't be understated. So unfortunately our overemphasis on moving cars quickly through our community means that we don't put enough investment in keeping people safe who are walking and cycling. And we see the result of that with the carnage of now up to 40,000 people a year being killed. Over a, um, two thirds of those are people who are walking and cycling. So vulnerable populations who are walking next to roadways becoming more vulnerable to traffic violence because we do not put enough investments in projects that make their mode of transportation being walking and cycling safer. And the same with public transportation, putting enough of an investment in saying that people who can't own a car or don't wanna own a car or can't drive are just as important to us. And we're going to invest in them being able to move around their community in ways that are convenient, safe, reliable, and dependable and more convenient. And so what this bill is about is about saying we have limited transportation dollars. Let's make sure that we spend those equitably and in a way that also places sustainability within the context of what we want to fund, meaning projects that don't just add more single passenger vehicle capacity, but also make more investments in public transportation and in active transportation infrastructure. So it's about all those things. It's about equity. It's about public health. It's about sustainability, absolutely. But it's also about building community and about making sure that we invest in all the ways that people need to be mobile throughout our society. And at the end of the day, it is about a systems change and it's about changing the way we live. And it's not about sacrificing. And this is something that I try to tell people who don't like this bill. If you think that increasing the ways that we can congest our streets helps anybody, it doesn't. We will have a better quality of life if we can move around our community in ways that are um, more convenient for all of us. So I was just in Boston where I wouldn't have dreamed of driving from Brookline, where my sister lives, into downtown Boston to take my daughter to Faneuil Hall where we went. You wouldn't dream of driving because it would take you longer and it's really expensive to park and it's just a pain in the butt. But I was able to walk four blocks to the T. The T comes about every seven minutes during the day in Boston. And get on the T, which is a light rail, and go into downtown Boston and be there in literally 15 minutes. It is a better quality of life for everybody when you have access to that kind of very robust public transportation system. So it's an improving on our quality of life. It's doing so in a way that is more equitable. It is making sure that we move into the future in a way that's more sustainable. And it's not easy. And we have had a lot of opposition to this bill from a lot of agencies and planning agencies across the state who have raised all kinds of concerns and yet have no real better answer to addressing all of these other goals. And that's why this coalition that's formed around this legislation and all of you that are here today are so incredibly important because to have systems change, you have to create a groundswell of stakeholders. And you are that groundswell of stakeholders who understand the importance of this. And that's the only way to tell these metropolitan planning agencies who, by the way, work for you as taxpayers, that no, you don't want every single dollar to be going towards widening freeways, usually in, in environmental justice communities. You don't want so, you want to make sure that it's, that there are, that there are um, systematic evaluations of these projects, that it's not just left up to them and uh, to make those decisions that you as stakeholders and taxpayers and voters demand that they are more transparent about emissions, 
that they look at all the users of, of transportation, that they um, think about this in terms of our climate goals, and that they reevaluate some of these legacy projects that if we were going to go forward today, we might say, let's do them differently. Let's, let's evaluate them differently. Let's think about other metrics. And I can't do it. It's not just me and Julia and Isaiah, um, you know, as important as they are, it's, it's us all together doing this because we want a better way to, for our children. And we want to have California lead the nation and the world in terms of this. So with that, I'll stop. And I know there's other speakers, um, but I, I can't tell you how eternally grateful I am to be here. So thank you. Thank you so much. And you know, I know Jenny, I'm adding you to the spotlight and this isn't on the agenda, but I feel like I'm inspired and I'm energized and I'm just gonna ask everybody to unmute and let's hear some love for this bill and for Assembly Member Friedman. I wanna hear dozens of you <laughs> clapping and cheering. <laughs> let's hear it. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. You are incredible. Thank you, oh. <laughs> Very oh, awesome. Wow. All right, thank, thank you. you. It's, it's, it's that whole coalition. It's all the activists. That's who's going to, if this passes or if this gets through Senate appropriation, it's going to be because of that, not me. So thank you. Thank you so much. Jenny, it's all yours. Actually, Danette, you're taking. Oh, I'm sorry. Does anyone have any questions for Assembly Member Friedman at this moment? No? I have one. I have one. Oh, oh sorry. Thanks. Great. We raise our hands. Uh, I just want to know who the co-sponsors are. You mean the co the co-authors um, yeah, the on co the bill? Yes. Uh, Julia, do you have the list of co-authors at this time? Co-authors? We don't have any co-authors besides something for Friedman. The co but Climate Plan is the co-sponsor. Okay. I just want to know who to talk to. <laughs> you can talk to you can talk to us. You can talk to them. Well, well, I want to talk to my assembly member, so I'll talk to Mia. Okay. Okay, great. We have uh, Wendy Ruiz up. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, my name is Wendy. I am a delegate to the California State Democratic Party, um, an elected member to the Los Angeles County Democratic Party, and an executive board member to federally qualified health centers. I just wanted to say um, I am really super grateful for somebody working on this bill. I, living in South Los Angeles, have seen how people have wanted to do the right thing and perhaps in some sense thought that good things were happening when they were passing certain types of, of rules or regulations or bills. But then the way that bike lanes <laughs> have been um, executed in some of our neighborhoods have not been thought out thoroughly. Um, it's really cool to hear, you know, over 19,000 miles of bike lanes in the city of Los Angeles or whatever the case may be. But if you actually use one of those bike lanes and it starts at one end of the, of the street and it ends at the very next and there's no transition, it's actually super dangerous. Um, and I am really, really glad that somebody is saying we should think of this long-term and the accountability piece for me is like super key. I, I, I really love the idea that we're like moving towards um, answering some of society's biggest questions, but I don't think that we've done such a good job of doing it thoroughly to where we're looking out to the future. Um, I don't just wanna say we've been successful in creating X amount of bike lanes. I, I wanna know that there's a whole system and that there's safe ways of transitioning from one part of the city to the other. And in my neighborhood, from one part of the street to the other. Um, I also wanted to speak, um, I guess, to the idea of transportation equity and access as it pertains to healthcare. I serve at a community health center that serves the most underserved in our community. And these are people that a lot of times are afraid of even coming to the doctor, afraid of speaking about whatever personal choices they make that may lead to whatever health questions they have. And it is so hard to get them to even come out. A huge, huge issue that we saw during COVID in particular was being able to service our, our elderly 
um, and our um, disabled uh, population. And I really feel like looking at this issue um, is really going to help a lot of them. So I just really want to thank uh, Assemblymember Friedman, um, Jenny, Amar, all of you guys working on this stuff. I'm, 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 it'd be an honor to help support in any way that I can. Thank you, guys. Wendy, we're going to hit you up for a letter for sure. Flex that e-board muscle. <laughs> um, Danette, do you want to keep going? Thank you so much. For yeah, um, we have Barry Toronto up next. Barry, do you want to go ahead and unmute? Yes, I am with, good, good evening. I'm with the San Francisco Taxi Workers Alliance. And what I don't understand, I believe there's some hypocrisy going on with particularly the um, the city officials and county officials who want to improve bike lanes and pedestrian access and and safer streets and slower streets and etc. However, they aren't given the ability to create tougher regulations, stricter enforcement, and caps on the number of Lyft and Uber vehicles allowed to serve their communities. It is up to the state legislature to, uh, through the state PUC, et cetera, to allow more local control of these vehicles that are doing a lot of illegal maneuvers on the streets, double parking everywhere, of using bus lanes and bike lanes and taxi zones, et cetera, to do their job because of how they're treated by the companies, but also with the lack of, of local control. I'd like you to respond to that and see if we can get the ability that if you're gonna, if you're gonna just talk about it rather than actually put into action steps that would, that would allow cities to make streets safer by drivers who are unfamiliar with the roadways and who are not professional drivers. I would love to hear a response. Thank you. Thanks. I, I'm actually less familiar with some of the issues between the um, taxi cab drivers and the um, the way that the that Uber and other rideshare companies are regulated. Um, a lot of that goes through PUC, um, but and I'm not as familiar and up to speed. And I apologize for that about the interaction between the PUC's oversight and whatever. Um, kind of regulations are put into effect by the legislature, but I am more than happy to sit down with you and your organization and discuss this and hear your concerns. It's just a, it's just a newer area. Actually, I know nobody's really ever come, approached me since I've, I've been chair for about a year now and I haven't had um, anyone approach me about this. So it's a new issue for me. So I, I would invite you to come and sit down or do a Zoom with my staff and myself and happy to talk to you about it. Thank you so much, assembly member. Uh, we have uh, Nadine up next. Uh, if you go ahead and um, unmute. Sorry, I just muted you again. Apologize. Hi, I just want to thank you for bringing this up. It's been a conundrum for me for years watching it from the sidelines. Um, I am elected to um, the Democratic Party of Contra Costa County, their central committee, and I sit on a number of executive boards for retirees and the um, disabled communities. So transportation is a big deal. So my two questions are, um, you talked about to reevaluate legacy projects. And I'm wondering if that would also look into the 12, or the 12 cent gas tax and the way that's being spent in communities. Uh, I know that when we voted for it, we, didn't, we weren't voting for toll lanes, but that's what we got. And it seems like a lot of that money went for toll roads. Um, and then the other thing is in Contra Costa County, we have five transit agencies and they're always competing for funds. They always tell us they're gonna start coordinating, but they never seem to be able to. Will your bill allow um, or have some kind of oversight or regulations so um, all of the different entities do have to start coordinating, not only within counties, but within um, areas? Um, Oh, you're talking about the, the different transit agencies within the Bay Area? Oh, I think you went back on mute. There are five in my counties that service us. And then for some reason, they put a bunch of counties that were not 
a, a regional entity together on a ballot measure, which um, two of the counties, my Contra Costa and Solano voted against it, but because we got lumped in with several other larger counties, right. um, we are now forced, all of our bridges have gone up and most of that money isn't coming into our community. Right, so we, so there is has been legislation about some of the cooperation between some of the transit agencies in the Bay Area. My bill does not uh, uh, really impact, you know, anything about sort of cooperation between transit agencies. It's just outside the scope of, of what we're working on. In terms of the funding of, of gas tax and how that interacts with this, I'll let Julia speak uh, to that a little bit and sort of what, what funds would be impacted by this. If we can briefly, this can get really technical, so I'm going to let Julia do a a high level, very quick, uh, you know, overview yeah. of that. I know it's like acronym soup. Um, yeah. So this, so it does impact five programs uh, that that are were established or added to as part of the gas tax. So that slide I shared, those five programs, those were all incorporated. Three of them were created by the gas tax, and two of them were added to by the gas tax. So, does that? Does that answer? So it impacts some money, but it's really about kind of encouraging and prioritizing what projects are funded within those programs. So how yeah, so it doesn't move different program, different projects into in and out of those programs, and it also does not impact the money, the very large amount of money that's set aside for road maintenance. So that money is not uh, affected by this bill. So like, it doesn't take money away from fixing bridges, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So there's no coordination mandated by this bill. It's going to continue to be. I don't, I don't, I, I guess I would say that I, I don't think this bill was really the, the vehicle to, to handle, to deal with some of the coordination issues. It's just, it's too much to put into something like this. I think that that's such a big issue in your area, particularly that it really needs its own solutions worked on through those different agencies and the legislators from those areas. Um, because, you know, uh, they, they got to work, they got to work their stuff out, you know, and it's, a, it's a, it seems like it's a bigger area, bigger issue in certain areas than in others when you've got multiple agencies, you know, transit agencies, but it's outside the scope of this particular piece of legislation. Thank you so much. Um, just a friendly reminder, can we keep our questions and comments short? Uh, we do have other people that would like to ask a question. We have Sarah up right now. Um, Thanks. Um, I wonder if somebody would speak to the issue of um, the strategizing and politics of getting some of the trade unions involved. Well, we have had, um, Julia, where, I, I'm not even sure right now where labor has landed on this particular bill. Yeah, yeah, no, well, that's because, yeah, some new amendments just went in print today that would remove a substantial amount of opposition um the they haven't sent a letter in yet but the big coalition that represents transportation industry and some um unions like the um laborers will go neutral the the building trades is still the one who is in opposition but um not with a, you know suggested amendments or you know where, where we can kind of go forward um but certainly and i think actually sandy is is certainly in the space to to speak to the labor nexus and how we can kind of get there excellent thank you um paul wormer you're up next ah and it's there we go off, off mute so first i want to say thank you that's really exciting to see a bill of this scope coming forward it's it's it, it really is a big deal I'm, i was a transit fan i'm i'm very happy to see it um i did have one question in particular with how it might play out and that is one of the things that has shocked me in the california code is the definition of a high tra high quality transit ca uh, corridor are you acquainted with that definition? Yeah, we actually did legislation one or two years ago to, to add uh, uh, certain types of buses to that. So this is something that I've worked on. Okay, but it's it's really, it's it's like 15 or 20 minutes in the peak period. 
Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about a transit shift, the shift to transit, that's not going to cut it. I mean, there's nothing that says where that transit has to go. Um, so in the mechanisms of this bill as it moves forward, does that create the opportunity for public comment to specifically address those sort of things? I think the way this bill is structured, what it's encouraging the agencies to do, and Julia, if I misstate anything, um, let me know, is it really does ask the agencies to start talking about emissions. And what that does is, you know, the transit agencies and the planning agencies are out there with the, the job of spending this money to move people around. Right. And if you are not creating a, a transit system that's robust enough to actually remove cars off the road, you know, if you're putting your investments into uh, what we've usually seen, which is the bulk of the investments going just into single occupancy car um, uh, infrastructure, then you know it's really hard to demonstrate that you're reducing emissions, right? When you're widening a highway, there's you know there's a few kinds of scenarios where you might be able to make that case, or or if you're creating a road that that decreases travel time because you're connecting two areas where you know in a shorter way you could make that case, right? Okay. Like you know instead of going around like this, now you're going to go like this. You might be able to make that case, but you're certainly going to be making that case a lot easier if you're creating. And one person talked about the inadequate bike lanes. Uh, you know, to show that your project, for instance, is creating an actual bike highway or a bike network where you're really mm -hmm. offering commuters uh, a much more um, appealing alternative, you know, that's where um, this would help to, ch to change the funding formulas and where the funding um, goes. So um, I don't know that the definition of high quality transit is going to mean much for where, these, where the funding goes in this. Like, it's an interesting question. But I don't know that it's going to, you know, that changing that definition would end up changing these investments. But I think what you could get, uh, if the investments are made correctly, if the bill plays out the way we like, you probably would end up with more high quality transit networks. You know, that's what we're going for is more, more networks that actually would qualify. Um, and the benefit of having those, those frequent uh, headways and those frequent definitions is that if you want to qualify as high quality transit, you got to run a lot of transportation. You can't make people wait a half an hour, you know, for that that bus or that train. So I yeah, think the that, goal is to really encourage um, more convenient and more robust transportation. Would you be willing to have more discussion on this issue? Because to me, this sure. is it's a real issue in the Bay Area, uh, and and observations, I, which are anecdotal, admittedly, but. I think there's some real challenges there. Absolutely, I would love to talk to you about it. And I don't live in the Bay Area, so it's always good for me to know, uh, you know, know from users, you know, how how it's working and how we can help. Okay, great. Uh, thank and you so much, Paul. For this. Thanks, Paul. And we're running a little bit uh, behind, so Vinny, if you could make your question pretty quick, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, I am going to have to go in a minute and leave okay. you um, with uh, with other folks. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for all this. It is definitely well well needed. I would just say um, a funny story. I did a position paper on cycling and I ran it by one of my you know, cycling expert friends and his one comment was, you left out transit. Um, and so in this, I kind of on the flip side, you really need to focus on biking and really linking uh, how transit and biking work together. Uh, for example, I um, beat my commute by bicycling home 34 miles, but I could only do that because I had BART. You know, if, if I didn't have, you know, transit, the bike did not did not work well. Um, so definitely, you know, a couple of people have mentioned it in the comments, but definitely whatever you can do to link biking and transit as you know, going together, that's important. The other thing I think is um, we all know that, you know, the auto industry, uh, not just fossil fuels, but our roadways and every highways are highly subsidized. Um, so I really think the idea of making transit free um, or as, as much as you can to subsidize it uh, is really important to get people, um, even if it's a couple of bucks, you know, people really do say, oh, if it's- I'm so sorry bucks, to interrupt, I'll, Vinny. I'll do it. So, all right, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, we're, you know, that's what we're trying to do is create these sort of robust networks, right, that that um, uh, allow people to use these different types of mobility, right, and and bicycles provide a huge solution for first mile, last mile, you know, you can ride your bike to a train station, take your bike, and it is good to see, you know, agencies like Metro is actually, you know, is bragging on the fact that they've ordered a lot more trains that are bike trains that hold a lot more bicycles, so it is definitely a uh, part of all this. Uh, I actually was... Um, 
uh, in Martha's Vineyard with my family on a little family trip, and we were biking around. And you know, we, there were only some of the buses took two bikes and some took three, and it really made a difference as to what we could take. You know, so um, I um, absolutely agree. And we're doing another bill, by the way, that we call our Omni Bike Bill, that's aimed at making um, cycling safer and um, you know, sort of revising a whole slew of um, uh, regulations around cycling to, to try to center those users of the road. So thanks for the question. Thank you so much, Assembly Member. Um, you, you are in Denver, <laughs> spending your time with us at this time. Um, she's, you're at a council. This is not my house. This is a hotel room, by the way. So yeah. it's much um, nicer than my house, I have to say. But, this town hall is put together so quickly. So thank you so much for your short notice. Um, I will leave the room unmuted for anyone who wants to uh, just rah-rah here. Um, thank you. I'm going to rah-rah all you. of you. And, uh, I love discussing this stuff. So I'm always happy to come back and, and you know, uh, I don't need filters. You guys can ask whatever you want. You guys are, are super educated and I want to I learn from all of you. I mean, these are questions that we're, when you ask these, we're thinking, I mean, Julia and I are like, all right, what do we do about this? Like, how are we going to, you know, fix this? So we love it. So thank you. And I do have to run, but thank you. You're so everybody. refreshing. Thank you so much for your honesty. Thank encounter. you, Assembly Member. Thank you. Amazing. All right. Sandy. Right. Thank you, Jenny. And I'll be quick. So as I mentioned earlier, there are ways you can get involved. And so I'm going to drop in the chat the advocate toolkit, which will link you on ways on how you can directly advocate to chair us, uh, uh, Chair Portino, uh, Senator Portino, who chairs the Senate Appropriations Committee, and also to additional members of the Appropriations Committee. Um, so there are links uh, to how to do it on the portal. There's also information on how to submit individual letters to the targeted uh, legislators and also uh, tweets that are, with, uh, that are already drafted for before the hearing on the 8th and post the hearing. So we're asking everyone to participate to please use the tool. The tool also includes emails of staffers of these key offices. So um, it should have everything in there and we encourage you to all to use it. Um, and definitely um, you can feel free to email me. Um, my email's right there. I can put it in the chat. If you have any questions or you need assistance, I'm happy to support you all. Thank you, Sandy. Um, one thing I just want to um, kind of inform people like right from right from where you are if you're a teacher you know talk about students and how it'd be great for students and great for your profession you know as a commuter working um write it from your personal space you know the dr bill shared his testimony on how to share um, how he might share it as a doctor right or um as a senior so right from where you are and, and letters of support if you have organizational support definitely get it and sandy has an amazing toolkit all right, so that concludes. Amar, are you are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Thank okay. you. So, um, look, I, if you can't tell, I'm inspired by the bill. I think it's a, a bit of a game changer for California, but we also need to be realistic, right? This is going to be hard. It's an organizing task. Anytime you're trying to decrease fossil fuel demand, you can expect those guys in suits to show up and be jerks about it and protect their bottom line and use that money to fund a white supremacist, fascist, asshole uh, legislators on the other side. So, you know, we're going to take this into the appropriations committee and we'll expect guys in suits to be there on the other side. So we know how to win this fight. You know, we've done it before and I'm proud to be here with the uh, Environmental Caucus and Igor and this whole team and Jenny and the assembly member to um, start the process to get this done, because it's a fight that we're going to have to invest in, right? If we want our budgets to match, uh, our, our transportation budgets to match our values, it's going to be a fight. So, you know, next we're going to talk about healthcare, another fight that we've been in with Bernie Sanders and others for quite a while. And I'm in, a, in a, just a moment, I'm going to introduce um, Phil Kim. But before we get there, in the chat, I would love to see some love for Jenny Chang for putting this all together on short notice, all these moving parts, bringing forth the policy experts and, and really making something special happen on an issue that wasn't getting enough attention. So thank you so much 
a Jenny who's just an amazing progressive uh, for the movement. It's you all. I have so much gratitude to the Progressive Caucus, Environmental Caucus, um, PDA California, Los Angeles Young Workers. I feel like I'm missing, missing. <laughs> but you know, Amar, Amar <laughs> Fatima, Igor, um, Selena, Linda, uh, Phil, California Nurses Association, Healthy California. Now, I mean, climate plan. <laughs> this was a village effort. It it really took everyone. So it's my hats off to you. Thank you. Uh, see, that's see Jenny, as soon as you give her some kudos, she's trying to deflect, but not uh, the thank you, seriously. Thank you for all the work you've done. So next, let's talk about healthcare for a little bit. I think everybody knows um, our next speaker, Phil Kim, but, uh, you know, usually I'd say that, you know, he's a, a stalwart, progressive, amazing organizer and, and let him come on. But I think, you know, um, for folks that are new to Phil's amazing work for the California nurses, or maybe a bit of a formal introduction is appropriate. So I want folks to know that he's a, a organizer based in uh, Sacramento with the National Nurses Union. He works on um, unions, Medicare for All, and CalCare campaigns. I'm sure you've seen him with his, uh, you know, drive in organizing that he's helped with. Before CNA, he was a campaign staffer for, for Bernie 2016, a shop steward, casino worker for Unite Here, Local 49. He grew up in suburban Maryland near Washington and graduated from Cornell with a BA in government. And you know, he's heavily influenced by his work um, around the anti-Iraq war protest movement, the writings and lectures of Michael Parenti. So uh, Phil Kim, take it away. All right. Um, thanks, Amar. Appreciate it. Uh, and thank you, Progressive Caucus. Uh, thank you, Igor and the Environmental Caucus. Thank you, Jenny, for organizing this event. Very timely. As as we break heat records across the world and experience more wildfires in California. Um, but yeah, my name's Phil. Uh, like Amr said, I'm a community organizer with the California Nurses Association. And to start, um, I'm going to show some slides here in a second. But I just want to make an observation that for both the issues of climate and healthcare justice, we are taking on powerful entrenched industries that make billions of dollars in profit from the current systems while causing harm and devastation to millions of people. And I'm talking about people who can't afford basic health care, we're going into debt for tens of thousands of dollars, as well as people whose lives are being ruined by the climate crisis. And in both cases, there are clear, obvious solutions, and many of them have already been implemented success successfully in other countries. So just look at the uh, really convenient and easy to use train and mass transit systems in many European and Asian cities. And look at the universal healthcare systems in the same countries where people have guaranteed healthcare that we're still fighting for. And for both issues in California, we're talking about pushing primarily Democrats in our state government to do the right thing, to show that they're willing to take on the billionaires and deliver real gains for the working class, uh, as opposed to performative corporate friendly reforms that don't fundamentally, fundamentally fix the problems. We have a lot of potential here in California for progressives to lead the way, to show the rest of the country what single payer and high-speed rail and other mass transit systems can do. And last note I'll say here before I launch into the, the slides is that uh, in terms of national politics, uh, this is how you beat the right wing and beat fascism, especially in rural, economically devastated parts of the country that have turned red over the last few decades. If we can win single payer in California, if we can improve and create functional mass transit systems in California, then we can show the way forward for the rest of the country and hopefully uh, usher in a national Green New Deal and Medicare for all in the not too distant future. So let me start my uh, slides here and I, I've got a few notes. Okay, is that working? Should be working. So, all right, let me uh, get back here. So I was uh, talking to Jenny uh, a few days ago and she thought it'd be good to mention that I'm a big uh, public transit and train enthusiast. Uh, I'm not a teen anymore, but I'm a proud member of the New Urbanist Memes for Transit Oriented Teens or NumTOT Facebook group. A lot of great content there if you're not already part of it. Uh, and in fact, just last week, I took three forms of mass transit from Sacramento to San Francisco to get to the California Labor Federation convention no cars. I didn't ride in a single car, and I had a fairly good experience. So here's a few photos uh, that I took, and this will connect with healthcare in just a minute. So I took the SAC RT bus to the Amtrak station, $2.50 fare, very affordable. 
I took uh, that to the yeah the Amtrak station, took the Capital Corridor train to the BART station in Richmond. That was $27, so not quite as affordable. It'd be great if we could eventually get that price down. Uh, and then I took the BART to San Francisco, a little over $5, very affordable, where I got to see former assembly member uh, Lorena Gonzalez-Fletcher being sworn in as the new executive secretary treasurer uh, of the Cal Labor Fed. And Lorena is a strong single payer supporter. She spoke at one of our Cal Care events last year. Uh, and the Cal Labor Fed last week reaffirmed its support for single payer by passing a new policy position. Uh, and we're hoping to work with them on some labor focused uh, Cal Care presentations uh, later this year. Um, and uh, we also, uh, while we were there, we also protested Amazon's plans to acquire healthcare company One Medical outside of One Medical's headquarters in San Francisco. And unfortunately, what's happening is big companies like Amazon, CVS Health, and major hospital chains are increasingly experimenting with dangerous home all alone schemes that replace hands-on skilled medical care with remote technology. And there is so much money in healthcare. It's 19% of our GDP. So all of these companies are looking for a piece of that and it's putting patients in danger. And by the way, a majority of that healthcare money comes from public funding, by the way. So this is yet another example of private companies profiting from our public funds. And by the way, Chris Smalls, the president of the newly formed Amazon Labor Union, Amr's wearing their t-shirt right now. Uh, he was there with us protesting against Amazon. Uh, with the nurses. And you can read more about these dangerous home all loan programs uh, here in the chat. I think Connor is gonna help me share some links, but I'll also share as I go. Okay, so now on to CalCare. Um, so what is uh, CalCare? CalCare uh, is the single payer guaranteed healthcare system that we've been fighting for. Basically a Medicare for all type program on the state level, a single public program that would guarantee care for all residents. And I'll say more about it in a second. It was introduced uh, as AB 1400 uh, in uh, 2021, uh, but it was pulled from consideration before the floor vote in the assembly about six months. It was a big disappointment. Uh, but our intention is to introduce a new CalCare bill in the next session in either the state Senate or the state assembly. And despite the really disappointing setback earlier this year, about six months ago, uh, we made a lot of progress. We grew the statewide movement for CalCare to be larger than ever before. And we successfully pushed the bill through the Assembly Health and Appropriations Committees. Uh, and we moved a number of key legislators to support the bill, ones who didn't, you know, who previously did not support it. So uh, we know that we'll be able to build upon this foundation. The nurses are more determined than ever to win. And we will organize uh, alongside all of you every step of the way here. Um, so a quick review of what single payer is, what CalCare is for those who are new. It means universal coverage covers all California residents, regardless of income or immigration, immigration status, a single public program, comprehensive benefits, dental, vision, hearing, long-term care, uh, freedom to choose any doctor or provider, so no more restrictive uh, networks, in fact, no more networks at all. Um, it would be completely free at the point of use and funded by progressive taxation, which would replace all premiums, co-pays, deductibles, and co-insurance that we're currently paying you know, through, the new, through, through the nose for. Uh, there would be a just transition for insurance and administrative workers who may be displaced. Um, and patient care based on patient need is another principle of CalCare. So no more financial incentives for providers to deny you care. There's a couple other policy features I just want to touch on um, briefly, and that is that uh, CalCare largely removes the profit motive from our healthcare system. So not just the insurance industry, but also on the provider side, it uses something called global budgeting, and also there's a special projects budget to fully fund hospitals, especially in rural and underserved communities. There are prohibitions on payments to providers for their profit, for their marketing, and for political donations. Uh, and then, as a lot of you know, there's been multiple economic studies showing that single payer saves money by reducing administrative waste, removing profiteering, negotiating cheaper prescription drugs, and by increasing primary care and preventative medicine. Um, there's, I'm going to share this link here if you want to read more about the uh, principles of CalCare. Um, Okay, so like I said, we made a lot of progress in the last year and a half, and I want to, you know, especially thank all of you who took part in the CalCare program 
uh, over this uh, last couple of years here. We had uh, volunteer district leaders in a number of districts. We did a massive round of, uh, of texting, phone calls, and postcards. We passed dozens of city council resolutions. So thanks to everybody who took part uh, in those efforts. Uh, there were, uh, yeah, thousands of people who took action in one form another or another in the past couple of years here. The SACB uh, and even a few celebrities came out in support of CalCare. Uh, we won the support from key assembly leaders, and we had a lot of uh, really well-attended virtual events and rallies. It was kind of an experiment, uh, what with the pandemic and all that we're still in, um, with all the virtual events and the car rallies that we were doing. But nevertheless, it wasn't quite enough to pass CalCare. So here, we, uh, here are a few lessons that we've learned um, going into this, uh, this new cycle of organizing. Uh, one is we need to start early. Building momentum takes time. Um, and I'll say more about that in a second. More organizing within the labor movement and in communities of color, that's something that we, we have to do a better job of, frankly. Uh, and then the third thing here is we can't let the legislature dictate for us how and when we will get our legislators on the, rec the record. Um, the exact legislative timelines for next year aren't out yet, but based on past years, the new bill needs to be introduced in either the Assembly or Senate by mid-February of 2023, and it needs to pass its policy committee by the end of April. This is in 2023. And because of the really, really strict legislative timelines in the California legislature, that means we have to front load our organizing before these deadlines approach if we want the bill to pass this time. And so that brings me to the, oops, sorry, <laughs> there we go, the, the pledge, the Nurses CalCare Patient Protection Pledge that we just launched a few weeks ago. And this is for elected officials and candidates at all levels of office uh, to take here in California. And I'm just gonna read it really quickly here. I pledge that I will do everything in my power as an elected official and or candidate to fight for the passage of single payer guaranteed healthcare in California, also known as CalCare, including but not limited to co-authoring a CalCare bill, voting for and advancing CalCare through the legislative process, publicly advocating for CalCare at events and through mass communications, passing resolutions, organizing my community, uh, promoting campaign activities, educational events, rallies, lobbying, et cetera. I stand with the California Nurses Association and the overwhelming majority of Californians who support this crucial legislation to fix our broken healthcare system. Uh, so that's a lot. Basically, we want our elected officials to not just support on paper, but to actually use their platform to fight for CalCare. And that's what the pledge is about. Um, so what we need is we need people who are willing to uh, contact their legislators or likely the income or their likely um, incoming legislative candidates to ask them to take this pledge. So I'm going to share a link here. And if you are interested in fighting for CalCare and you want to help put us in a better position in 2023 to pass a CalCare bill, please sign up as a district leader and we'll follow up with you with all the materials and training that you might need. Uh, and yeah, we just shared that in the chat. Um, and you would basically be responsible for reaching out to your assembly member and state senate candidates, as well as other politicians, because um, any elected official or candidate can, can take this pledge. Oh, and by the way, let me share the pledge itself. If, if you are an elected official or candidate, feel free to take the pledge. And there are instructions at that website um, on how to take the pledge. Um, if you're wondering um, what the district leaders will do exactly, it's pretty simple. The main roles, like I said, are to, to number one, contact your legislators, other candidates, ask them to take the pledge. If they say no, um, or if they don't respond, uh, what we're doing is COVID safe, uh, socially distanced QR code canvassing in your community to get community members to sign a petition calling on your legislator to sign the pledge. Uh, and to work with CNA staff, we have a team of organizers. I think Elisa and Ryan are here with me in the, the meeting. Uh, work with us on other ways to convince your legislators to take the pledge. And hopefully we can get a lot of this work done before uh, 2023 so that we're in a really good position when the new session starts. And I want to emphasize that uh, we have a really unique opportunity with the incoming legislature. Over a quarter of the legislature will be turning over due to a variety of reasons, term limits, redistricting, people running for a different office or getting a different job. 
Um, and we are likely to have several new strong CalCare supporters elected, folks like Pilar Chiavo, Liz Ortega, Dave Jones, Aisha Wahab, a number of others. Uh, so there will be a new dynamic in the next session, as well as new committee appointments. So if we want to be in a good position in 2023, we need to organize now and reach out to all of these incoming candidates, all the likely candidates, and ask them to take this pledge. And that's what the district leaders will be doing. Uh, if you're not able to be a district leader, I totally understand. There are other ways to help, and you can sign our uh, CalCare uh, petition. Uh, and if you're a fluent Spanish speaker, um, we are looking for fluent Spanish speakers to take part in our CalCare para todos uh, organizing program that Mari Lopez uh, and Maria uh, Torres Lopez are working on. So we'll have more information about that in uh, in a little bit. If you missed, I just shared a ton of links. So if you missed any of the links here. I've compiled them all in this handy CalCare handout. So they are at the top of this if you wanna get involved in any of the CalCare campaign activities, as well as have access to any of the fact sheets and video recordings of uh, different events. So definitely uh, check that out. The last thing I'll say here um, in my time is that uh, the governor uh, recently you know, made some announcements about the recent Medi-Cal expansion, uh, which is a victory. Um, California Governor Newsom, uh, he signed a state budget recently that expands Medi-Cal eligibility to all California residents who meet the income requirements, regardless of immigration status. Uh, and this was a, a really hard fought and important victory. It'll provide health care for many immigrant families, about 100, uh, sorry, about 700,000 people. Um, and this is an important stepping stone towards guaranteeing healthcare for all, but we know that it doesn't go far enough. By expanding access to health insurance, uh, Medi-Cal expansion maintains a fragmented, profit-driven system of private insurance with highly unequal tiers of care, and it risks leaving millions of people without the care they need, even if they have coverage. Uh, and one of the points we like to make is that coverage and access to health insurance is not the same as guaranteeing comprehensive care at the point of service. Access to a broken and expensive healthcare system is not a comprehensive or real solution. And what we really need is CalCare. So as you can see with this little chart here, um, the Medi-Cal expansion, it's a step in the right direction, but it's totally inadequate. It maintains a fragmented, profit-driven system with unequal tiers of care, and it really does not uh, control the rising, skyrocketing rocketing cost of healthcare for those of us who are paying, uh, as well as our employers that are paying for that. So uh, yeah, I went through a lot of that really fast, but let me just share one more thing, like our email address, we check this account on a regular basis. So if you have any um, questions or if you need to reach out, we're always open to good ideas and, and talking about things. Um, that's our email address. Again, thank you all for listening. Thanks, Jenny. Solidarity forever. Phil, thank you so much. You're such a wonderful, peaceful, focused, hardcore organizer, <laughs> rare qualities. So appreciate you being here. Um, Danette, I believe this is yours, right? Yeah, we have one question. Mary McDivitt, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, uh, Phil, um, I'm Mary McDivitt in Sonoma worked with you a lot on uh, the car caravans and very interested. I've been out of the country, so it's good to get an update. Uh, I was just wondering uh, if you have received input from uh, the physicians for a national health program. I believe when they evaluated the bill originally, they had some suggestions about board membership and so forth. They might have sent it to assemblymen uh, uh, Calra, and I was wondering if you had seen it or if the nurses would be uh, amenable to receiving physician input uh, on a revised bill. Yeah, I um, well, first off, we're open to any input. So like I said, if you um, email us, if you're with any group, uh, if you want to email any ideas or suggestions, we will pass those along to our GR and policy folks. Uh, as far as PNHP specifically, uh, I'm not sure if we've received any input or not. Uh, but definitely uh, feel free to email us uh, at this email address and we're happy to pass it along. Okay, thank you. Yep, thanks for all your work, Mary. Thank you, Mary, that was amazing. And uh, Terry Rodriguez, you're up. I'm unmuted? Yes, go ahead. 
Howdy, Bill. My name is Terry Rodriguez. I'm the um, with the Placer County Democratic Central Committee. I think you might have known me. And uh, I, yeah, that's right. And uh, Terry Brady and uh, Scott Johnson. And uh, I believe you were my guest at my very first month as the Auburn Area Democratic Club president. And I'm also the uh, chair of the Central Committee Legislation Committee. Now, just to let you know, uh, because of uh, Terry Brady and Scott Johnson, that they are very uh, hot on AB 1400 last year, uh, I backed them. And I was backing them any way that I could. That was inviting you to speak. And uh, that was inviting anybody to speak on the subject. And uh, I even uh, had it endorsed through the uh, Central Committee, as, in addition to the AADC. And uh, I was writing articles on it in support through our Communications Committee. Now, one of the things that I asked Terry and I asked Scott and I, I was uh, insisted on, and also I ran through uh, Assemblyman Cholera, but I wanted to hear, I wanted to see the, a budget plan from the state of California, from the assembly that would tell me that this could be financed. I really didn't get anything. I got it from your other source from CalCare. But I wanted to find out how are we going to support this. I did read the Amherst uh, analysis, and I found that difficult to, to see where that would that would help out. Now, uh, my question to you is that: Have you actually worked out a budget along with the uh, state budget office that would be approved by the that may be approved by the new legislature? Because when it went before the assembly. Some of the Democrats sided with Republicans against it. Now, I've talked to some of the medical professions, and I agree with uh, Ms. McDivitt. Are you talking to the medical um, uh, sector to find out how they feel about it? Because most of the people I talk to are very negative about it. And I, th those are the two things I believe that are, that are the weakness. Now, I am willing in January, when the new legislation season uh, comes up, to adequately promote it again. But those are the two factors that I need to know as my ammunition to help you out. So how are you going to help me to help you out? Yeah, um, good questions, Terry, and, and thanks so much for, for all your work. Um, uh, so for, let's see, uh, financing, you were asking about budget uh, proposals and whatnot. Um, so what happened last time is um, when the bill, I think uh, my memory is a little hazy, but when it went through the health committee, part of what happened was Kalra, um, who was the lead author before for AB 1400, he also introduced, introduced a companion bill called ACA, uh, was it 11? Uh, Assembly Constitutional Amendment. And what that had was uh, a specific set of proposed taxes. Uh, which was meant to be a starting point of a conversation of what the the financing proposals could be. It wasn't meant to be like a definitive thing when they introduced it. So there was a specific financing plan introduced, and that was part of the agreement for allowing AB 1400 to go forward through the committee process uh, as they were discussing it with assembly leadership. Um, I don't know. It, it's too soon to say, I think, at this point, whether um, the new financing proposal will be similar to ACA 11 or something more developed, because there was admittedly more work that had to be done with ACA 11. That was really meant to be a starting point. Um, and then, uh, let's see, you were asking about the doctors. Um, yeah, like I said, we're always open to all kinds of input, so uh, but we'll definitely take that into consideration. Uh, and any groups, you know, definitely welcome to reach out to us. Um, there might have been something else, but I can't remember. Feel free to email or call uh, if I didn't answer everything there. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, we have uh, Terry with a question as well. Terry? Yes, I just want to finish this up because uh, I am prepared to help my friends up here uh, on the uh, Central Committee as well as those that are on the AADC to fight for what you can bring forth in the next legislative season. But I would really like you, because I talked to uh, um, the candidate for uh, state Senate, I believe uh, six, Paula Velasquez. And I indicated to her that a good point in her campaign, it's just what I stated to you on the budget, with the possibility that CalCare and the state budget office can work together to hammer out 
a financial package to support this bill so that we don't run into what we ran into the last time? Yeah, definitely, definitely hear you on that. Um, you know, one of the things uh, about this last comment I'll make, I guess, is that we know that single payer, and I'm sure Cindy, our next speaker, is going to hammer this point home. But single payer is cheaper than the current system. All the studies have shown that. And even when we do put out a more specific and concrete financing proposal for the for the next CalCare bill, they're gonna there's gonna be plenty of people with bad faith arguments saying oh, you guys want to, you know, triple taxes uh, and talk about it in a really limited way, not sort of acknowledging the bigger bigger picture that, well, hey, we'd, we'd actually be replacing all premiums, co-pays, deductibles, co-insurance with a progressive uh, tax taxation system. Um, so that's part of, um, you know, one of the things we'll have to talk about and, uh, you know, to com combat some of the propaganda that we're going to see again uh, going forward, for sure. It's good to, good to think about this, though. Thanks so much, Philip. And um, I think that we need to start wrapping up. Um, Amar, or I'm sorry, uh, go uh, hand it off to Amar and um, so we can talk about what's next. All right, well, thank you. And you know what? I had a lot of these um, cow care conversations around the state with assembly members, and we heard a lot of bad faith responses on that financing issue. And I'll, I'll, so I just add one thing, and Ryan mentioned it, Ryan Skolnick mentioned it in the chat too, but it's really difficult to effectively build the financing bill without the federal government um, and the waivers. And we can't even get to that process until we have the policy bill designed so we know exactly what the final version of that is. Um, so, you know, if you think about it, it's it's like a building, you know, a, very, a new house, complex building. You have to have the architect lay out the plans before you can actually go and price it out. And, and that's, you know, how we should think about and maybe talk about this bill. And I'm sure that Healthy California Now and the folks there will talk about this more. Um, but just do not allow yourselves to get bogged down in the financing bill. It is completely appropriate to tell an assembly member and senator that yes, support the policy bill, AB 1400 before, whatever is numbered now, support the policy bill. And then yeah, afterwards we'll get together and we will work on the financing. And if we can't convince you on that, fine. But there is zero reason not to support the policy bill. They will just use financing as a bad faith a reason to oppose it. So there's my little uh, rant. Um, so it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Healthy California Now, Cindy Young and Acid Compost are here. And when we think about how we're gonna get this done, right? We need a coalition. And that's what Healthy California Now is. It's labor, DSA, faith-based groups, Green Party, Democratic clubs, seniors, LGBTQ, just everybody working together on a common policy goal. And without Healthy California Now, I just really don't think we could get it done. So thank you for the work they are doing. Let me give you an introduction to Cindy Young as we bring them uh, online here to Spotlight. Cindy Young started her career in the labor movement as director of research for Unite Here Local 2. She served as senior health policy advisor for California School Employees Association, Association for over 20 years and also worked as a special projects coordinator and policy specialist for CNA. She's currently retired and serves as vice chair of the Healthy California Now and on the board of directors for the California Alliance for Retired Americans. She supports and continues to support Bernie Sanders. And, uh, you know, that's just, I think, a key um, commonality between so many of us. I'd also like to tell you about Astrid Campos, who's uh, joining us, um, an experienced community and labor organizer with more than 15 years working for health, education, worker, economic justice, as a political and community organizer with National Union of Healthcare Workers, helping to build and maintain relationships with labor and community allies in LA, Kern County, around the state, and has a real passion for social justice that grew out of frustrations I think a lot of us have with racial, social, economic inequality um, that you know we all experience that she experienced growing up in conservative uh, Orange County. She has been a leader in organizing work for the Affordable Care Act in 2009. And after that, um, you know, organizing with healthcare workers and education rights. So thank you uh, to them both. I will leave them to uh, close out 
as the final portion of our program tonight. Thank you so much, Healthy California Now, for being with us in part of the coalition. Uh, thank you so much for having us here. And I want to say Michael Whitey, who is president of our organization, is also on tonight. And I'm just going to ask him to chime in at any point in time that um, he'd like to. And I'd like to save a few, few minutes at the end of his presentation to um, to have you know ask him to uh, weigh in a little bit. But Astrid and I have uh, collectively made the, the you know developed this presentation. And I just want to say a little bit about. Did he, I'm sorry to interrupt. It's Danette. Um, I think your earbuds are rubbing on your shirt and it's picking up a lot of static. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I should grab my headphone. It's okay. Um, so I just, you know, Jenny and I were chatting a little bit earlier today and she said, you know, what is it? You know, she was prompting me like to tell a little bit about myself. So I'm just going to share the story about what made me a healthcare activist. And uh, I was on the 1983 bargaining committee um, serving as Unite here, Local 2 in San Francisco, as their director of research. And um, we were in bargaining. There were two issues left on the table. One was the employer wanted what we call fully bargain language, which means they could have a little flexibility in the work rules, but they wanted to take away retiree health and welfare. Uh, away from people who had carried those trays, cleaned those bathrooms, made those beds, washed those dishes, made those cocktails, right? You could go on and on, you know, check people in, wanted to take away retiree health and welfare. And it was just an epiphany for me at that point in time about how ridiculous um, and cumbersome and unfair this healthcare system is that would allow some of the richest corporations in our nation to take away health and welfare from people who had given 20 or more years of their lives um, making these people rich. So that's just a little personal kind of uh, story about, uh, about just to share about me and I'll get on with our presentation here quickly. So um, I'll talk a little bit about who we are. You know, we're a coalition of community organizations, consumer organizations, union, disability rights community, um, uh, LGBTQ community, business community, political organizations that really are committed to advancing healthcare uh, as a human right in California. We're very specific. Uh, we're very focused specifically on you know doing something to develop and implement a single payer system here in California. Uh, we believe that the current political dynamics now are, uh, you know, critical at this moment. Um, we have a governor who has publicly said he supports single payer. Our healthcare system is in shambles, and you know, COVID certainly highlighted that. Um, that the employer-based system is not working. You know, people are public infrastructure around having access in our communities is not available. Was not available, right? So we've been organizing to support, to begin to engage in the federal waivers, right? Process that, um, that was mentioned earlier, that's required to capture those you know, funds needed for a successful single payer program in California. When we're talking about financing, if we can't get the federal money, Medicaid, Medicare, and other funds into our state, then we can't have the financing that's needed to fund the healthcare that's needed for every resident of California. Oops. So um, our healthcare system is broken, as all of you know, and we can't afford our current system. Certainly, Phil had mentioned earlier, you know, our current system is twice as expensive as every other system in every other modern nation. It, single payer does four things in my mind. It ensures everybody. It saves money, it saves lives, it improves quality, and it also has health planning where instead of building, you know, hospitals with koi ponds and, uh, and uh, you know, valet parking, we're actually building healthcare clinics in the community that need them so desperately. There's a lot of talk about food deserts in this country, but we have healthcare deserts, you know, places where there is no nowhere to access the care that they need because we don't have a system that is supporting building clinics where the population needs it the most. Um, I always use this slide when I'm talking about healthcare and I threw it in after Astrid and I practiced earlier today. So I apologize in advance, Astrid, but this slide is comes from the Kaiser Family Foundation and they release an employer survey every year, <clears throat> generally in the fall. And I just 
think that this slide tells a really important story about what's happening to workers and others um, in our country around health care. Um, you can see that workers' earnings is the, you know, the block line, overall inflation is the blue line, and family premiums, you know, is, is that yellow line at the top. And what is happening is that healthcare, as healthcare costs increase, if you're lucky enough to have employer paid coverage, they're beginning to cap their contributions. So all of the increases are falling on the backs of workers. Uh, they're developing plan designs that have huge out of pockets uh, expenses through co payments or deductibles. They're creating these narrow networks where people don't have adequate access to care in their community. And so our healthcare system really is destroying um, our standard of living um, because as milk is going up, gasoline is going up, right? You know, sending your kids to college is going up. All those expenses are going up, right? More and more of our wages are getting sucked out to um, fund a system because we have to keep our families insured, right? People are not gonna take the risk of not having their family insured. And so they're gonna give that up. Um, so I absolutely believe that, um, you know, this issue is impacting our standard of living for sure. Oops. So, you know, the, as I mentioned earlier, you know, COVID-19 um, really brought out um, you know, the horrendous aspects of, um, of our system. And um, there was recently a study done by a university that showed, you know, how many lives could have been saved, how many dollars could have been saved. And the failure has a disproportionate toll on communities of color, in fact, um, because they are more adversely impacted than those of us who may, you know, may have uh, access to more services in, in a more afflu affluent communities. So um, it just highlighted, you know, to me, the, the pandemic just brought out the worst parts um, of our healthcare system and showed um, how just the huge gaping gaps and, and wide chasms that there are that exist in uh, those of us that have are lucky to have, I have two healthcare clinics that are less than a mile from my house, but I, you know, still work part-time in the school community and there are in rural communities and there are miles and miles and miles you can go without getting access to healthcare uh, in those communities. So uh, improved Medicare for all um, is the answer. Uh, that's that's where we need to go. That's what everyone on this call understands and knows, and it's just figuring out how we're going to fight for it and uh, and when. So, Astrid. Yes. Uh, good evening, Cindy. Um, Sorry. So, but, yeah. I, I'm sorry. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay. Um. So yeah, I think as uh, folks were saying, um, we understand that our current healthcare system is flawed. And we also know that it's extremely racist and the folks who need to get healthcare currently are not getting it. Um, our vision for uh, the future of Medicare for All is we need to have equality. We need to demand the single standard of care for all. Uh, we need to have justice, that we have the right to health care, right? We know it's a human right but our current healthcare system does not have that. And we also need democracy, right? We, we, um, uh, we exert uh, popular control over our healthcare system. Go to the next slide. Cindy? Yep. There we go. Thank you. Um, so guaranteed healthcare for all, right? Everybody in, nobody out, all residents, are covered regardless of immigration status. So as you heard from Phil earlier, um, California this year finished the task of making sure that every undocumented person who who's eligible, financially eligible for Medi-Cal will now be eligible for full scope Medi-Cal, but we still know that leaves a lot of, um, of our uh, undocumented brothers and sisters out of the healthcare system. If you make above the uh, federal minimum wage, you will not qualify. Um, the care you need when, where uh, you need it, right? We heard earlier during the transportation conversation about certain, um, about the lack and the disproportionate, um, uh, even the inequality within our transportation and 
the bus, the, the, I'm sorry, the bike lanes, right, in South LA. I lived in South LA for a long time, and, and I think like Cindy said it, we don't just have food deserts, but we also have healthcare deserts where depending on where you live and where you're at, you're not going to get the same type of quality of care and your outcomes are going to be very different. And why we know that the pandemic hit um, communities of color at a disproportionate rate than white communities. It eliminates barriers to care, including premium and other out-of-pocket costs. Next slide. Right. And then we go into the equity portion of it, right? Um, it eliminates uh, the segregation of care based on the ability to pay and where you live. Uh, Medicare for All will guarantee that healthcare to everybody has a single standard of care, right? It will not matter. Um, we know currently under the Medi-Cal system, who, who takes Medi-Cal, you know, versus our current Medicare system, right? We know more providers. We know that the reimbursement rates matter and who is choosing to accept it. So with a single payer system, with a Medicare for all system, it guarantees that everyone will have a standard of care. Medicare for all will fund community clinics, hospitals, and public pro programs are every, everywhere based on community health needs and not the needs and not the need to make profit. I can definitely do that, Cindy. Uh, or yep. do you want to go? Here. Um, so, yeah, go ahead and take it. Yep. Have you got it, Astrid? You want me to pick it up? You can pick it up. Okay. So, what's been happening? Um, we have been we have been very focused on the Governor Newsom's uh, uh, Healthy California for All Commission and its findings. Um, it was established by uh, Governor Newsom in 2019 in the legislature, you know, at the urging of many of us, right, of single payer advocates and leaders to chart a path for unified financing, including single payer, that gives every resident of California a guaranteed right to um, health care. Dr. Mark uh, Galley is the uh, is the secretary of the California Department of Health and Human Services. And this just kind of lays out the governor had eight appointees, four legislative appointees, five ex officio members, you know, including Senator Pan and uh, Senator Wood, which Senator Pan is chair of the Senate Health Committee and uh, Assemblyman Wood is chair of the Senate Health Committee. And they began meeting in January of 2020 and they issued a final report. All of this is available online. Um, you could go through every uh, meeting if you wanted to um, and look at uh, it's all recorded and also all the presentations that have been uh, presented to the commissioner are, are, um, are available. So um, the commission's fi uh, findings, right? The solution must address equity, respect, and, and uh, in providing health care to all to Californians. So they're uh, the, the top three healthcare issues are, it has to be affordable for patients, treats all patients with dignity and respect, regardless of income rates um, uh, or documentation status. And I just wanna say how pleased I was that Phil, you mentioned the immigration bill, that there is always this tussle when we've been organizing for years around you know, covering um, people who are not documented. And that bill takes the air right out of that argument. And it, in my mind, is a big advance for us. Not perfect, but gets that issue off the table. So we don't have to talk about it anymore. It just is now um, to provide effective, safe, and responsive care. So uh, the commission presentation um, by uh, CPAN and um, uh, shows that you know low income Californians, 65% of this survey um, you know indicated a support for single payer state run um, uh, healthcare system. And I know that you have been working closely with them Astrid, do you wanna talk about this a little bit more? Yeah, happy to. So, um, so we, if folks who are not familiar with CPEN, it's a great statewide organization and, um, that works in coalition with community uh, groups across the state to work on um, healthcare equity, right? And so with the commission, they, um, they did a survey over 1900, they surveyed over 1900 folks in multiple languages 
um, all within uh, below the 250% of the federal poverty rate. And some of the stuff um, and some of the information that came out of it was, you know, extremely positive. I think Phil earlier discussed how in order we need to do more work in communities of color. And we know that our current, um, uh, we don't have enough community of color organizations and community of color folks who are leading in uh, this healthcare system. And as we know, California being a minority majority state, it cannot get done without having the voices of people of color leading the way. And with the survey that was done with folks is, it said that over 65% of Californians surveyed supported a government funded healthcare system. And that's huge. And amongst people of color, it overwhelmingly supported it. And amongst uh, specifically, you know, it surveyed Latinos, Black folks, Asian, Native American folks, um, amongst Latinos, they were the highest in saying that they supported a government-funded health care system. And that's huge. We already know that we have a base of folks in California who support it. And what are the next steps, right? We know that there's things that we can do now to address equity. We have force, workforce development. Uh, we can start now to recruit and train culturally competent health care providers. We know we don't have enough. And we know that that matters. Language and cultural understanding um, when going to your healthcare provider matters for comfort and trust. We also know a single payer system can help facilitate the change in culture to one um, in order to achieve the dignity and respect that communities of color are, are, are demanding within that they don't currently have in our healthcare system. So, um, you know, the first commission study finds that Medicare for all would save $500 billion um, and 40,000 lives over the next 10 years. And um, Ken Jacobs from the uh, Labor Center at UC Berkeley, actually, if you look at November 17th, you'll see his entire presentation. So some people think that financing is not important. I absolutely uh, think it's as someone that's organized for help single payer for a long time. I actually think it really is super important myself because people want to know, is this going to save me money, cost me money, how much? This allows us to talk about this in really broad terms and to say, if we had a Medicare for all system, right, we could save $500 billion and 40,000 lives over the next 10 years. And if we do nothing, this is key to keeping people not, you know, to not do anything, right? This inertia that sometimes we can get to. If we do nothing, healthcare costs will increase $117 billion. When we talk to legislators, we can say, we can, we have something to say around creating a single payer unified uh, financing system that it will save billions of dollars and that there's, it's now documented, a study's been done, the commission adopted it, right? We've got a presentation uh, to lay that out. So we can pay less and get more. And um, when I've used these talking points, I've had a lot of success in people getting a better understanding um, of what, what it is that our state is trying to do around saving, saving money. So can you talk about the calculator a little bit, um, Astrid? Sure. Um, and we'll go ahead and post it as well. So we just launched um, this cal uh, calculator that you can go in. I just put it in the chat. If you go to it, it's going to be able to calculate how much you would save with a, um, with a Medicare for All system in California, right? It's going to ask you how much are you paying in premiums, you know, maybe what your employer is, um, uh, you know, what your employer pays, and then it will go ahead and give you a calculation. I know for me, I have employer paid health care 100%, but I would still end up saving, I think it told me more than $2,300 because out of, you know, all out of the uh, out of pocket costs that go with it. So um, what can you save and improve, you know, and by launching this, and we ask you to share it, right? Share it with your different networks, have folks um, publicize it so they can start to see that under a single payer system, we will have savings and take away from the conversation about the cost, right? We know it single payer as it, uh, in, in a unified system would be cheaper and now they can see it firsthand in uh, their pockets. Okay. 
So um, the calculator covers, whoops, sorry. Let me just move this up and out of the way so we can see it. The calculator covers a comprehensive coverage, right? Cradle to grave, primary and specialty care inpatient service, dental vision audiology, uh, you know, um, uh, reproductive health, expand service to individuals, long-term care, home-based care, substance abuse disorder. You know, it's a, it's a comprehensive set of benefits that are included um, in the, you know, as we, as the calculator was built, it includes a full comprehensive uh, set of, set of benefits. Oops. Um, and also, um, you know, guaranteed coverage again, you receive care when you need it um, and how and who you want. You have freedom of choice. Um, there's no hassle with insurance coverage, no out-of-pocket costs. So what's next? Um, so um, I just, we just launched the calculator today. We're trying to push it out. Um, it actually will work even I used it today. I'm on Medicare. I actually could put my numbers in there and make it work. I was really pleased about that. Um, oftentimes, people forget that our health that we do have some publicly funded benefits, um, and it's in, and so now as a medic, someone that's on Medicare, I can actually calculate my own savings. Um, governor's uh, Governor Newsom's Healthy California for All Commission report validates the savings and sets a pathway forward. Right, the Democratic. Majority uh, majorities in Congress and the Biden and Harris administration, you know, put health care reform on the table again. Uh, you know, Attorney General Becerra's confirmation to lead California's Health and Human Services puts a prominent Medicare for All supporter, right, as he was a congressional representative for years, right, um, in charge of approving the state universal health care programs, which will help us with this waiver process, which is the next bullet, negotiating federal waivers with the Department of Health and human services to obtain the money. We have to get agreement to get that money in the system um, so that California can guarantee health care to all of its uh, residents. That that's, we've got to, in order for us to make the financing work, we have to know that money's coming in. Um, and then we want to work with labor councils, city councils, democratic uh, committees that have passed resolutions in support of Medicare for All talk in California. This is certainly good. They're wonderful education tools as you're working through getting uh, support for, um, you know, from the various uh, entities. Um, and um, I'll, I just want to also say we've, uh, you know, we're, the governor just passed, or not the governor, but the legislature just passed a budget that includes 1.3 million for staff and experts to work on the next steps for the commission, including the federal waiver. So this really could advance um, us, you know, upping our game a lot. Um, the two staff people at the Health and Human Services will coordinate uh, and enter in negotiations on, on the federal waiver process um, and, get, and hopefully get the needed support that we need for uh, California. The staff is also working on the, the uh, uni unified financing. What does that look like? Um, and they'll coordinate the next steps coming out of the commission report, and, you know, including um, you know, the support and implementation. Um, we are meeting with legislators to ask them to, um, you know, step up and support the commission's work. And I was very pleased today to just learn that my assembly member is going to sign on and actually, and I'm, I live in assembly district four. I, she has been not so great on healthcare, but serves on the health committee. And she has agreed now to, um, you know, to uh, sign on uh, and just support the commission's work and the governor and pushing the governor in the right direction. So uh, the governor's commission changes the issue from whether to do single payer to how to do it right. It's no longer a question. Um, and we need the governor on our side, no matter if we have legislation, if we have the commission, no matter what strategy we have, ultimately, whoever the governor is, is going to have to sign a bill or lead the way. Um, these recent victories are important, but we must continue to hold Governor Newsom to his promise to do single payer. We have to hold him to it. We have to make him do it. Um, and so that's up to us and making our movement grow. So um, with that, I'll stop sharing my screen. And Astrid, thank you so much for being my partner tonight. And we're happy to answer questions if there's time. Anyone have any questions?
Yes, I have one. Um, so what can people do? It sounds like your legislator in District 4 signed on. Um, I guess they can pressure, in, in addition to supporting the bill, um, pressure their legislators to pressure the governor. Uh, Jenny, is that a, was that a question? Yes, is, is there a sort of a action that people can take in regards to getting the governor to take action? I think continuing to write letters to him and and also to get our legislators to let to, to tell the governor that this is important in their district, right? In their Senate district or in their assembly district. If he's got members of his party putting pressure on him, it provides him with cover. And, um, and also he gets a sense of what's happening in those districts around the, the issues and problems that people are having with access, cost, you know, availability, not enough providers, you know, nurses and doctors and other healthcare workers are leaving this industry because it's been miserable for the last three years. And we have got to stop that so that we have a workforce that can serve the communities that live in the state. Thank you so much, Cindy and Astrid. Um, oh, it looks like we have a question from, is that Bruce? Donette, you want to take over? Yes, sorry. Um, Bruce, I'm going to, oh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, uh, it, it's more a comment. Um, I, I got the calculator today. Uh, I'm on the HCN board, uh, and uh, I sent it out to, after I did it for myself, and I'm retired on Medicare and find out that I would say $4,000 a year, which would be significant for me. Um, but I sent it out to my entire network and suggested that they plug in their numbers and find out how much they personally or their families would save and then to share it, it with their networks because uh, it's a very good and motivating tool to see how much you'd save but also knowing that you won't have to go out of retirement to get a job to be able to pay for dental work, dental work because it isn't covered in Medicare or um, sacrifice uh, vacations and, um, and um, other even more important things to be able to keep up your insurance or pay out of pocket medical care. And those are for people who are lucky enough to have, like I do, access to medical care. So just a suggestion, the calculator's been posted in the chat. Try it yourself and send it out to your network. Thank you. Next, thank you so much, the great president. And the calculator's impressive. I think this is gonna be super helpful. Um, for grassroots advocacy and, you know, people who don't understand that they could save money to actually be able to plug numbers and make that kind of real, like how much would they save for themselves in their household? It's a really, really wonderful asset. Um, Fatima, awesome Fatima, it's all yours. Okay, yeah, thank you. I'll just be short because I know we're a little bit over time. Um, but I want to first thank Jenny for putting this together. Um, you know, as women, we don't always take credit, but Jenny, you led this, you know, great, um, you know, coalition and, and brought it together. So thank you so much, Jenny, for all your work and for being so organized. And thank you to Healthy, Healthy California Now. Uh, use that calculator. Thank you to um, CNA for all of your tireless work and make sure you all sign up to be district leaders like Phil talked about. Um, and thank you to Assembly Member Laura Friedman, everyone from your office that's here, to all the people that are here, the Progressive Caucus. Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Fatima. I'm an executive board member of the, um, of the Democrat, California Democratic Party and uh, Southern California Vice Chair with Ben uh, Hauk um, of the Progressive Caucus. We're really proud to partner in this town hall. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to speak a little bit about, you know, a lot of you spoke about, you know, South LA, but how important this is, we, you know, we feel these issues very personally. And for me, um, all of my organizing is always around intersectional issues and systemic change. And that's exactly what this was about, right? Um, to bring, a, bring, a, bring folks together who are working on transportation um, and then bring folks together that's work, who are working on healthcare um, 
um, is, is just phenomenal because that's how we have to think of our communities, right? We cannot play chess with people's lives. We have to really um, look at a human being from every aspect and see what's missing and look at issues equitably as well. Um, I know in South LA, I experienced that so much. We're surrounded by freeways. We don't have good public transportation. Um, and we and it affects us. Our healthcare is affected because of it. We also don't have um, healthcare as a human right, and that's affecting so many, um, you know, in the life expectancies, the diseases that we get. Um, and you know, we do have so much work to do. Um, but what makes me hopeful is that we are going to all do it together. Um, and we might have different ideas and different thoughts, you know, about how we get there. But if we are together, we are stronger than all the corporate interests out there. We're stronger um, than any of the money and profit profit based interests out there. Um, so just a reminder of our action items. Um, hopefully Jenny and her team can post. I know we need to get letters into Senate appropriations um, and see Senate, Senate report and Tina support this bill. So if anyone from uh, SME member Friedman's office can post how they would do that, who they would email to get those letters in. Also um, get your legislators and your candidates to sign the nurses single payer pledge. I feel that you can post all those links again, um, you know, how folks can volunteer to lead their districts. And also, uh, please share the Healthy California Now calculator again. Please share that out as well to just see how much people would save um, with guaranteed health care. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, everyone. I don't know, Jenny, if you wanted to say anything, uh, but I'm feeling very inspired um, tonight. And thank you again for all of your work and bringing all of us together. Thank you, Fatima. I really appreciate it, especially your personal touch. Um, just want to thank you all again for being here on a Monday night. Um, such amazing organizers and policy advocates in this room. I have so much respect for you all. And also the things that, you know, I can't, like, some of you just have really great energy and smiles. And, like, thank you for that. Um, we need it in this movement. We got to really stick together. Um, I really believe that. Um, Thank you. I just want to reiterate the organizations that were involved. Um, we saw Healthy California, California Nurses Association, uh, Climate Plan, uh, Office of Selma Merlora Friedman, um, the Progressive Caucus, the Environmental Caucus, uh, Los Angeles Young Workers, and mm, I'm missing one. PDA, Progressive Democrats of America, California. Hell yeah. All right. Thank you all. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Amar. Got some jams.
Good night, all.